my humble respect to Guru Mahan, Guru Piran Sivasangaran, Guru Piran Nyo, fellow Nyanis. Today I'm going to continue uh, the final part of this chapter. Uh, and this is also on man and his relationship with earth and every other biological being. <clears throat> and uh, you'll see in part four, I'm going to talk about existential threat. Man, while has got a lot of good virtues, has a lot of uh, development over the many, many hundreds of thousands of years, you know, uh, from evolution. And nature has helped us to become who we are today. It has helped us to, um, you know, become, uh, to develop our brains, develop our body, uh, help us to think help us to rationalize, help us to create knowledge, help us to transmit knowledge, create languages, create mathematics, create poetry, a whole host of things that helped us as a species to develop, to create new knowledge, to create technology, innovation, the whole works. And we started as a small uh, group of uh, biological beings, as of June 6th, we are 8.1 billion people on this earth. And we are continuing to grow. And in that process, we started becoming very dominant, a dominant force. Earth has many forces. As I said, you know, it has wind, you know, fire, uh, you know, uh, temperature, you know, uh, water systems, you know, a whole host of natural systems. And these natural systems make up this biosphere that we call Earth. And many species live because of the natural system. But one of the systems that is becoming very dominant is the human system, human beings. So scientists call this Anthropocene. Anthropocene is how human activity is influencing the nature systems and how nature systems are reacting and having an impact on us. So we see that the health of the planet is having an impact on the health of the people and the health of the economies. So they're all, you know, closely tied together. So in this... <clears throat> Uh, there is a nice uh, article on this, uh, you know, if you can see the link below there, the source that tells you how there are vital signs that shows that our Earth is really ailing. And some scientists say that the Earth is in life support. Life support means it's an ICU, right? And if we don't do anything, uh, Earth will die a natural death and will have an impact on us. So in spite of all the evolution that man has, man is becoming an existential threat to all biological living beings, including human beings. <clears throat> and recently, uh, this week I visited, I was invited to give a talk in Bangkok, a very large conference with 3,000 over people that they talked about the global sustainable development goals and the state of the planet, planetary health and human health and the health of the economies. And the report card does not look very good in spite of all the innovations and technological developments that we have made. We have not, we have actually made situations even worse for ourselves and for uh, other biological beings. So in this, I want to see what is, how do we as a species move forward, uh, address this issue taking a spiritual lens. <clears throat> so what is meant by God? And this is uh, a question that is asked to Mahan uh, on what God meant. Many people give very abstract notions of God, uh, you know, and uh, here Mahan gives a more pragmatic uh, answer to what God is. He says, God created everything, you know, in this universe. Everything emerged from God. Hence, you know, uh, a part of God is with us and in everything that we have. So part of the creator 
who has used the creative force to create all the creations, the DNA of the creators embedded in all the creations, including human beings. So here is the response from Mahan, answered by Mahan. He says, what is meant by God? He says, God is actually what water, land, animal kingdom, human beings, villages, towns, taluks is like a, a commune, a district, state, country, continents, all are collectively known as earth. So it's describing God as all uh, you know, creation, including earth. Similarly, he says that sun, skies, stars, earth, all the planetary systems are collectively known as God. So he sees that the entire material universe is God in itself. God in different forms. God that manifests in different, different things from, you know, <clears throat> energy to atoms, you know, molecules, you know, more complex molecules evolve over time to form, you know, all the elements in the periodic table, you know, stars, suns, planets, galaxies, nebulas, you know, and then we see that the formation or the creation of complex biological beings, one cell, two cell, and ultimately very complex uh, biological systems, including the human system. So Swamiji says, this is what God is. So we have many abodes of prayers and abodes of places to worship this divinity, this God. So we have elaborate, uh, you know, prayers and things like that to give honor and grace to this divinity. But what we do is that while we honor divinity in a ritualistic way, which is great, but our actions do not see God in everything in this universe. So after prayers, we go and pollute the land, pollute the rivers, pollute all the sticks, not realizing that is also God. That is why in, in many of the scriptures, in some uh, you know, schools of thought, all these elements are also treated as gods, right? So, so we see that, you know, great saints and sages wanted to imprint in people that while there's a lot of, you know, practices to give us discipline of the mind and to obtain the grace of God, we also have to observe the creation of the creator which comes in the form of lands and rivers and lakes and people and other biological things. Somehow, you know, our knowledge about this is not complete. So Mahan reminds us that part of wisdom knowledge is to have the complete knowledge. That is why he says paripurnam. Paripurnam means complete. Right? Complete means to be able to see everything as part of the complete system, though it may be complex, that completeness, you know, the understanding of this complete system gives us a complete understanding of our role in this complex system. So this is why all the you know, wisdom knowledge is to go really deep, to have that good, we have to transition from the rituals the acharas to the vichara. And this is what Mahan tries to bring us to this understanding. But human beings being human beings, <clears throat> they tend to think, they tend to look at things in a very simplified, easy way out. Just do the rituals and everything will be okay. But they don't transcend that ritual. So what they are thinking in the practice are not aligned. So what do we have? We see that, you know, we will have all the elaborate rituals, but we go and pollute the environment. We treat other animals badly. We, you know, uh, fight among each other. All those things. This is that is not complete knowledge and understanding and wisdom. So what 
what has mankind become? So they've become more profit-centered, very materialistic, and has veered away from the true purpose of humanity. So the humanness in everything that we do, it is very materialistic. A very return on investment kind of mindset, not return on values. Humanity has lost its values. And that is why you see that the price paid by Earth and the environment and others are enormous, including human beings. As I said in the last YouTube clip, the incidence of cancer have gone up. The incidence of diabetes and you know heart ailments and asthma, and including finding microplastics in fetuses. Right? Even the child before it's born, we are already seeing microplastics. We are seeing the lungs of an unborn child is equivalent to a smoker who has smoked for 30 years. Right? So we're seeing that our actions are having major impact on every biological beings. Places where we have crops, right? Today the crops are not there because our pollutions have killed the bees, killed the insects that cross-pollinate these plants and trees. So we see the bees are disappearing, insects are disappearing, slowly the plants are disappearing. When plants disappear, grass disappear, we see all the other smaller animals disappear. Ultimately, it moves up to the food value chain. But even we can't put food, food systems are disrupted. We use artificial foods, coloring, we put artificial things in there. And we see that we have a lot of processed food. At the end of the day, it impacts the health of the human beings. And we're seeing that you know, the lifespan of people are starting to get shorter because of all this. So we see that ultimately what we do to the earth, what we do to the other animals is coming back to us. And this is what every action has an equal and opposite reaction to us. What we do to others comes back to us too, in our direction. So we're seeing that how do we shift? So Meditation, introspection, contemplation, reflection, meditation is very important, but it has to transcend from just an abstract idea, you know, a shock scenery idea. Uh, you know, we only need, uh, you know, enlightenment. No, that enlightenment must awaken the wisdom in us to say, look, how can we make a difference? How can we make the change? How can we make the behavioral shift in our mind so that we can teach our children, we can teach our communities, we can slowly help others to also live this harmonious life. So when I was in Bangkok recently on this big summit on global sustainable development, the whole 3,000 you know, delegates from around the world were discussing, you know, the earth is in deep trouble. We human beings need to make that shift. Our corporations need to make the shifts. The governments need to make the shifts. Communities, you know, rural communities, you know, native communities, have always been nature-centric, yet we have neglected their voice. So we're seeing flooding going up. I mean, if you see the, the news today, flooding in Florida, flooding in many countries, landslide. We're starting to see now dengue uh, appear in Europe. It used to be a tropical disease. So we have mutations that are taking place. Dengue is starting to spread in colder climate. Before, it was only in warm, temperate climate. So we're seeing these changes that are happening to, to, to the earth because of our activity. And we see that, you know, we have put the earth in, in deep trouble, you know, pollution, you know, atmospheric pollution, you know, we're throwing a lot of, uh, you know, waste into the food. We're starting to see a lot of you know, chemicals and, you know, very hazardous chemicals seep into human system like arsenic and so on, lead. There's a lot of deforestation that is changing the climatical condition. We dump a lot. People waste a lot. And we're starting to see forest fire in every summer in North America, in Canada, in Australia. We see forest fires that are wiping thousands and thousands of acres of land. And you see the amount of animals die, the loss of biodiversity. All these are causing global warming. All these are causing you know, increased pollution. All these are causing, you know, disappearance of insects, plants, animals. Many animals are becoming extinct and slowly it's moving up the, you know, food chain and it's coming to us. So 
as human beings, yes, we have the thinking capacity. Sometimes we think about the wrong things. And even Swamiji has alluded to the fact that we need to have the right knowledge to be able to ensure sustainable development. So I want to uh, bring you to some work that myself and Prof. Shanta and my team have been working on. And this is a paper that we published uh, recently on the state of human condition, picking up from the work of Mahan and many other great saints. You probably know that the Earth's temperature has gone up uh, significantly over the last two, three hundred years uh, from industrial revolution. You know, we use a lot of coal and that's causing a lot of uh, uh, pollution. And you see that Earth's atmosphere is getting warmer. So we see that over from the 18th century of Industrial Revolution, the temperature was reasonable. Uh, you know, this is pre-industrial age, but by the 70s, we saw that the economic development, our development, population was growing because of post uh, because of post World War II, birth rates went up. We needed more homes. We needed more energy. So we started, you know, utilizing all the resources that Earth had what I call zero-sum development. That means we grew at the expense of nature or the environment. And we started seeing the temperature going up because of pollution trapping heat. And, you know, by the time 80s, 90s, we saw our temperature is about 1.5 and we are going to be breaching that. So we then did a, a kind of a scenario analysis to say, what if we don't change our behavior? the temperature will continue to increase. And we are seeing this significant increase. If it move up to 2%, two, 2 and we are already seeing heat. Recently, the election in India, many people died because the heat is phenomenal, right? Many of them don't have air conditioning. The poor suffer more, right? So we are starting to see heat waves across Europe, across, you know, pretty much around the world. So we're seeing that at temperature increasing, you know, environmental stress on the natural system is phenomenal, right? And as the temperature, if we don't do anything, the temperature is going to continue to rise. And we are going to see if it goes up above 3%, we're going to see ecosystemic collapse, you know, and we're going to see Earth not going to be habitable, right? And if we don't do anything by the time if the temperature goes up by 5%, we'll see a lot of species will become extinct. And it increases existential risk to humanity itself, right? And this is a lesson for all of us, like how the dinosaurs disappeared. We too, if we don't change our way of life, humanity would also cease to exist. But the interesting thing is that we need to know that, you know, we need the earth. The earth doesn't need us. Right, the Earth existed uh, be even before human beings. So note that we human beings were given a place on Earth, but yet we have not looked after it. So Earth will eventually take us out. You know, in in this paper that we wrote, we say that we have to reboot our way of life. Otherwise, Earth will boot us out. You know, of this ecosystem. But what is interesting is that, as I said. Earth doesn't need us. So if, when we disappear, we see that we will stop using fossil fuels, we'll stop encroaching on nature, we'll stop harming animals, and you see that Earth will recover. I'm not sure if humans will recover, but Earth will definitely recover, regenerate, and revitalize itself. So the thing is that we as human beings, we need to ask, do we want to be wiped out? Or do we want to ensure that our species grows, that could continuously pass on this knowledge and live in a sustainable way? And this is what Mahan and Great Saints say, look, we have to make sure that we are in harmony with nature. And that is part of the spiritual journey, spiritual pursuit. The rituals is one thing, but the rituals need to deepen our understanding of our relationship with nature and how nature is part of us and we are part of nature. Whatever we do, we harm nature and the divinity. So again, we see that, so we map out the scenario that if we don't do anything, we as a species will disappear, particularly in the next 100 to 200 years, right? If we, if temperatures continue to rise, I think 
Earth will not be habitable for biological species. We only have one planet. There's no planet B or the second planet for us to go. There was a study done that it says that how many planets at the current consumption level, how many planets do we need? At the current consumption level, they say that we need 1.5 planets. That means we are overusing the planet's resources. So part of our spiritual journey is that how do we make sure that we don't overconsume? We use what is needed. You know, we kind of recycle things. And this is the new way of re-looking at things. So in this scenario, we show that, you know, uh, if we don't change our ways, uh, we will lose our way and we will lose out. Earth will remove us either through disease or things like COVID where millions of people lost their lives, you know, and all kinds of new diseases that are emerging that are not just, you know, people are getting cancer at a very early age, all kinds of diseases. So, and uh, COVID was essentially a disease that is related to climate. Climate has changed mm -hmm. the, the viruses, the viruses mutate and they become more virulent and they disrupt our immune system and eventually uh, people get very sick or they pass on. There are many other zoonotic diseases or many other infectious diseases are on the horizon if we do not you know, change our way of life. So what's the way that Mahan and other great saints uh, tell us? You know, we are, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we are, in, you know, we are currently in uh, step three. I said from step one is actually uh, pre-industrial age and then post-industrial age, we are in step three where the temperature is about 1.5. We may breach it. And if you see the temperatures over the last six months, we have breached all the, the temperature, uh, high temperatures. You know, so, so we are currently in step three. So if we don't do anything, we'll move to step four. Ultimately, we end up in step six, which essentially potential risk that we will not exist as a species, you know, and Earth will regenerate itself. So what do we do in step three? Right, We have to take a values base. We have to take a spiritual approach if we want to exist as a species, right? What does that mean, values base? As Mahan said, we have to be nature-centric. Whatever we do, we want to make sure that nature, we minimize the harm on nature, making sure we have a lot more green cover, you know, not destroying trees, you know, not polluting the rivers, not polluting our lakes and the oceans. Minimize plastic because the plastics are ending up in the landfills, also the rivers and the and it's causing microplastic contamination. Slowly, we know from uh, fossil fuels, you know, um, you know, make sure that we don't waste food, use food, utilize food in a more efficient way. So it's about that mindset of nature-centric. Every time you want to consume something, you ask, do I need this? Every time you want to uh, spend some money, you ask, do I really need this? Or can I conserve this? Or buy something which is nature-supporting uh, and you know nature-centric. So look at the labels very carefully. You know, When you are going out to buy, ask the first question, do I really need it? If I need it, will it harm the environment? Will it harm nature? You know, is there a nature-based solution that I should explore? So these are the questions that are also part of that spiritual, you know, maturity and the spiritual expansion. So that whatever we do is nature-centered. So this is also part of Mahan's teaching that he says that we cannot go against nature. And as we do introspection, contemplation, reflection, meditation, you start experiencing nature, your mind becomes more and more anchored, your mind becomes nature-centric. When our mind becomes nature-centric, you see that you know our actions too become nature-centric. Our intellect, our thinking capacity, our, uh, our ability to analyze, make inference, ask the right questions so that whatever we do, whatever actions we take becomes nature-centric. 
right? So nature is part of our own natural system. If we harm nature, it impacts us and everybody around us. So we see that part of the spiritual journey, as what Mahan said, was that everything in this universe is God. Everything in the universe manifests as God. Everything in this universe is God packaged differently, including us. When the mind realizes it, the mind becomes godly, divine, and nature-centric. Sandosham.